introduction. Um, I'm going to speak a little bit first of all about the uh, context for the outdoor arts sector before inviting our guest speakers who have joined us today to present their perspectives from a range of different organisations working across England. Um, as some of you will be aware, we had our session yesterday, so thank you for joining us uh, to meet all of the other participants on our programme. So the context for these sessions is uh, an, a series of online conversations for UK and Korean outdoor artists and producers who want to develop understanding of each other's contexts and opportunities for seeing and presenting outdoor work in both countries. Um, we've designed this program to support people who are ready for international touring and would like to build the skills and knowledge required for building those international relationships. This activity is being coordinated by Extracts and is part of our wider Global Conversations program. Um, this was developed in response to the events of 2020 and the pandemic and has been run as a series of online conversations for international colleagues to continue conversations and facilitate information sharing and, and build new relationships, even though we can't meet in person. So just some practical things. We're running these sessions as Zoom meetings, which means everybody is present in the room. Feel free to keep your cameras on or off. Um, we appreciate people are working from home and may need to step away from the screen um, for a minute. So yes, please feel free to do that. Um, if you could just keep yourself muted, just check that you have your audio muted just to avoid any background interruptions, that would be great. Um, and if you wish to ask a question or to speak, um, please either use your raise hand function, um, which you can access from the bottom menu in reactions, or um, you can kind of physically give us a wave as well. Um, and I'll be inviting people to um, pose their questions to our panellists. Um, so I'll indicate the appropriate moment to do that. You're also very welcome to continue the discussion in the chat box um, on the right hand side. Um, today we're joined by our Korean interpreter, Sung Hyun, who is currently doing simultaneous captioning in Korean. So uh, I've reminded our speakers today to just make sure they're speaking clearly and slowly. But again, an invitation to any of our participants for whom English is a second language, please do feel free to ask questions or ask for clarification um, if you're not following what's being said. Um, and we'll do our best to support you with that. Um, we also have been encouraging people to share the conversation online. So you can tweet or uh, share on social media about your uh, involvement in this programme. Um, please use the hashtag career connections to do that. So unless there's any other immediate questions at this point, I'm going to start by sharing my screen and speaking a little bit about the outdoor arts in the UK. Uh, so before I do that, can I just, I'm just going to look around the room and just check no one has any queries at this point. No? Okay, perfect. So one second while I do this. Can I check that everybody is able to see that? Thank you. Um, I'll just see if I can make it full screen. Yeah. Okay, perfect. So, a little bit first of all about extracts. So, 
So I'll start with a brief introduction to our work, although I'm aware some of you are already familiar with us. Um, we are a UK-based development agency for the outdoor and street arts. We manage a diverse range of projects, which includes the UK's largest network of outdoor festivals, Without Walls. We also support artists producing, touring and development. This includes managing the international touring of a large scale aerial theatre show, which is pictured here. This is called As the World Tipped by Wired Aerial Theatre that has toured widely internationally and to, into several East Asian countries. We also deliver events and programmes which aim to showcase the UK sector internationally. I wanted to speak a little bit about the UK context. Um, this may be obvious information to some of you, but um, when we refer to the UK, um, we mean England, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. Uh, Great Britain refers just to England, Scotland and Wales. Sometimes people say UK, but they are really referring directly to England. Um, so in many ways it doesn't really matter, but it's just useful to note those distinctions. Um, there are different cultural identities and different arts councils providing funding with different policies across all of those four nations. Um, and so it's useful to be aware of that depending on where you might be looking to present your work. The biggest of these areas in terms of population is England. Um, that is where Extracts is based and the majority of our work is focused as we receive support from Arts Council England. Um, there is a diverse population in England with many different cultural identities and cultural influences. We estimate that there's around 9 million people living here who were not born here in the UK. And that's out of 66 million um, total in the UK. The currency here is pounds. This is, we are the only European country to use this currency. Um, and the language, main language spoken is English, as I'm sure you're already aware. We're also currently navigating the impact of Brexit. So our departure from the European Union last year has an impact on the movement of people and goods between the UK and Europe. And so it's worthwhile being aware of what those challenges might be for artists and companies who are wanting to tour in this region and particularly traveling between the UK and countries in Europe. When we talk about the UK sector, Sorry, I've jumped ahead. Ah. Oh, one second. Sorry, it's just throwing me out. <laughs> one second, everybody. My apologies, my computer's just crashed, so I'm going to just carry on without my slides. These things happen. <laughs> so uh, in, my, in my next slide, I was going to speak a little bit about the definitions and the use of terms. So to be clear, in the UK, both the terms outdoor arts and street arts can be used to describe performance which takes place in public space. 
Uh, creating and presenting work in these public contexts offers new ways to connect audiences and communities with their environment and offers new possibilities for artists. We also believe and have seen evidence that outdoor arts can be good for supporting the local economy and tourism, attracting audiences to shopping streets, town squares, parks and outside venues. And because of this, one particular strength of this work is its ability to reach audiences who don't attend other forms of arts activities. And over the past 10 years in the UK, there has been a sustained investment in the outdoor arts. And so there is a good infrastructure existing for artists and events. And we'll hear a little bit about some of those organizations from our guest speakers today. We also have a high number of outdoor arts events that take place mostly across the summer season from April to September. And I know that's slightly different in Korea where you have uh, two seasons, a kind of spring season and an autumn season with the festivals. Uh, increasingly, we also have more and more winter festivals. These often pro focus on presenting light-based artworks which illuminate the dark winter evenings. There's been a high level of investment to support outdoor artists to develop their work. And as a result, there are many high quality shows that are touring in the UK. Um, for example, the Without Rules Network, which I previously mentioned and which Extracts has a role in uh, managing, has commissioned over 200 artists to produce outdoor shows and many of these are still touring many years after they were originally created. Um, I would say that the particular strengths of the outdoor arts in the UK um, is the support for uh, dance companies. So there is a really strong profile for contemporary dance work here in the UK, as well as strong representation from disabled and ethnically diverse artists as well. Um, and I will share my slides um, today because I had some images and examples of different companies um, uh, which you can have a look at later on. Um, I've mentioned Without Walls a couple of times and it's useful to be aware of what that is. Um, it's the largest network of UK outdoor festivals. This currently includes 35 organisations that are working across England to present a, a real mix of different programmes taking place across the year. Um, we invest funds from the Arts Council of England into curating a programme of outdoor work, which is commissioning artists to create ambitious new projects that then go on to tour across the network of festivals. We also invest in research and development opportunities for artists and festivals which includes training programmes um, and funding research and development for artists to develop ideas and practice. This is uh, referred to as blueprint funding, our blueprint programme. So collectively, as a network, we're helping to develop strategic areas for the sector as a whole. And um, so looking to create examples of good practice for artists and festivals when it comes to areas such as environmental sustainability and digital led work and accessibility for disabled and deaf audiences and performers and also audience development. And um, obviously, like many of us here, um, our work was affected last year by the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, but I'm pleased to say that during 2021, we've actually seen quite a strong return of the outdoor arts sector um, with many events starting to take place again from May of this year. Um, there were also a few festivals who managed to deliver scaled down events last year, at the end of last year in 2020. Um, including the very first one to return, which was Greenwich and Docklands International Festival. And we have Bradley here with us today, who I'm sure can tell us a bit more about um, the context for that. 
we've obviously had to consider how best to manage during these times and to deliver events safely. So this has included limiting audience numbers, introducing ticketing and hygiene facilities and encouraging people to wear face coverings. Um, it's also been interesting to see how festivals have changed their programmes. And um, so perhaps following a more decentralised approach with performances taking place um, across locations and scheduling or out into local community set settings. And um, so rather than the kind of large mass gathering of people in central areas, there have been smaller, more intimate audiences engaged in different neighbourhoods. Um, obviously, of course, this has really limited the potential for international touring here. Um, so many of the festivals have not been able to present um, international programmes where they might have done before. And so there's been a greater focus on UK artists. But of course, we hope that there will be a recovery over the next two years and that we will be able to invite international artists back in. Um, so I was going to just speak a little bit about the practical arrangements for how you might go about approaching festivals um, and some things to be aware of. So most UK festivals are booking artists six to eight months ahead. So for summer festivals in the UK in 2022, many are looking at booking now. Um, I would suggest that you uh, can contact the, e the festivals by email. Um, we have uh, a range of directories online through Outdoor Arts UK and Extracts and Without Walls, where you can see the range of festivals that are out there and also identify the key contacts um, for each of those events. We strongly recommend that you prepare some high quality marketing materials um, of the show happening in performance um, and also preferably with a film trailer, a short one of around three minutes. Um, and you can send these via email directly to promoters here in the UK. Um, lots of promoters might not book an international show they have not been able to see, but if you have a good film, then that can really help um, and obviously given limited travel at the moment um, I think this is uh, people are more open to booking work that they haven't been able to see in real life as it were in person and um, we'd also really recommend that you have a good quality full-length film of your show um, so it doesn't have to be um, super high production it can just be one single camera end on um, to your show being run through. Um, but it can do consider how this gives an impression of the work. And um, we would also expect to see a technical rider. So this is a document um, which provides technical information for your show and practical requirements, such as the number of people on tour and the travel requirements of those people. For example, if you have a company of six people who will require travel from Seoul to the UK, whether cargo is required, if you have any set or props um, that you must carry with you. And the festival, um, festival will need to know how, how much they will need to provide in terms of accommodation um, and other subsistence, so catering and so on and any technical needs um, for your sound. Um, we have templates um, actually at Extracts that we'd be happy to share with companies who are looking to, to develop these documents for the first time. Uh, most shows that take place at UK festivals are between 20 to 50 minutes long. Most are around 30 minutes. Usually companies would be expected to do two shows a day if the show is shorter in time, then maybe that would be three. Um, walkabout and strolling shows, so shows that kind of move through space or promenade, are normally expected to go out three times a day. It's worth being aware that in the UK, in midsummer, it doesn't get dark until 10 p.m. at night. So many festivals will be finishing by 11 p.m. and there are very limited hours where the festival is on 
that there is darkness. So you need to be aware of this if you are looking to present work that requires darkness. Um, for example, light based work. This may be only um, practical for a limited number of the summer festivals. Later in the year, by September, it does get dark earlier, so that's, there's more flexibility, um, but it's a useful point that <laughs> sometimes can be overlooked. Uh, the weather here is also super changeable, so um, it can be very hot, but it can also be very cold. Um, and we advise artists to be prepared to perform um, in rain, not super heavy rain, except where it's really dangerous. Um, but audiences in the UK will usually stay and watch the show if it is raining. And we would suggest that you consider how you might adapt the show to perform in different wind and rain conditions and be able to explain that to a promoter. Um, you will also need to provide a risk assessment. Um, there's quite strict health and safety rules here in the UK that we have to um, follow. And so again, it's useful to check out what the differences might be um, and make sure that you're providing the information required to assess the potential risk to artists and public from your show and how you will um, put measures in place to ensure that it can operate safely. Again, there are templates available um, that can help to, to put these documents together. For an international company, if you're coming to the UK for the first time, it can be quite hard to structure a tour. Um, and so having a producer or a tour manager working with you can be really helpful in that sense. But obviously it requires time to identify that person and set up that relationship. And um, when you're looking at uh, if you have a secured performance uh, in the UK, then promote your performances to other festival organizers um, and consider what else you might be able to do whilst you are in the UK. So consider workshop opportunities, for example, um, indoor shows or residencies so that you can build a schedule that um, allows you to make the most of your, your trip to the UK. Um, and also promote um, your performances. So make sure that other festivals know that they have an opportunity to come and see your work whilst you're here in the UK. So uh, those are some brief things, really. There's obviously a lot more that we'll, we'll look at discussing in more detail on Friday. Um, however, just to let you know that extracts um, can offer some resources and support, I've mentioned already document templates. We also run um, large showcase events and maintain an international directory on our website, which it's free to sign up to, um, where you can represent your work. Um, all of this activity is aiming to create new international partnerships and promote international working. And um, so I would strongly encourage you to obviously follow us on social media and see what events we have coming up. Um, and whether you can uh, attend any of our showcase events, which between 2020 and 2021, we've been delivering mostly online, as you would expect. Um, and in my presentation slides, which I'll share, um, there are links to those recent events that we've hosted where you can watch back um, some of the discussions and access um, information about the artists that we profiled in those events. So, um, uh, there's kind of a brief summary at the end of my presentation, kind of summarising the key points from this, but I think this is probably a good point at which to, um, for me to finish and to hand over to um, our first speakers. So we have with us um, this morning Danielle Corbishley from 101 Outdoor Arts Creation Space, which is based in the southwest of the UK in Newbury. And I'm going to invite Danielle to um, Join us and share her screen, if she can see and hear us. Hello, Hi. good morning. Thank you, Hannah, that was brilliant. Hello, Hi. everyone, good morning, hello. Nice to meet you all, hello. So, Danielle, would you like to share your screen and hopefully you have more success than I do? Oh, yeah, check this, ready? This is professional level sharing, ready? Three clicks. Check. 
done. Ta-da! Magic. Yeah, that's great. Thanks, Danielle. Thank you, Hannah. That's brilliant. Thank you very much. Um, yes, my name's Danielle. I'm the head of 101 Outdoor Arts Creation Space, as Hannah said, which is um, uh, a wonderful facility in the south of England, um, probably about an hour's drive from, from London, between London and, and Bristol along the, the south. Um, I'm very, I'm, I've been to South Korea twice, actually, I'm really pleased to say, uh, once to, to Ujongbu uh, Theatre and Dance Festival with uh, an amazing outdoor pyrotechnic show called 451 with Perry Plum, which was a few years ago, which was a fantastic opportunity. And also randomly years ago uh, to visit the Samsung head office. Uh, in, in Seoul with my mother, who was a graphic designer, and we designed the international um, exhibition stands for Samsung. So I had this amazing trip when I was 18 to South Korea. Um, then we drove uh, down through the country to visit their, their sort of the village where they make all of the white goods as well. And we stopped off at some really lovely places along the way too. So well, I'd love to, I'd love to come back, come back soon. Um, and I welcome you all here as well. If you're ever making work for the outdoors and public space and would like to come on a fantastic international residency, I would invite you to come here to join us at, uh, at 101. But yeah, so we are, we're a, a national centre uh, for the development of work for the outdoors and public space. Uh, we're a 20,000 square foot a uh, fabrication rehearsal facility where artists from all over the world, predominantly the UK, but uh, we do have lots of international artists, come to stay with us on site um, in our on site accommodation and rehearse in our uh, multiple rehearsal spaces, uh, some small, some very large. Um, to, to develop ideas and to come together and to, to devise and to craft and to make and to, to rehearse. Um, we are part of uh, uh, an, another organisation called the Corn Exchange, which is a regional theatre in Newbury, which is a 400-seater uh, regional, uh, regional um, receiving house. And we're, we're part of a portfolio, wider portfolio of, of organisations, um, although we are um, independently run and we serve the, the national community. But we have this interesting relationship with this regional theatre in our area where we share resources uh, and also present some work locally. Um, so I'm going to just talk to you a little bit and, and take you through some slides from different activity that's happened here. I'm not just going to focus on the, the ambulance. That's quite an unusual, interesting one to start with. I'm going to talk you through some of the activity that has happened here um, over the last three months and give you an idea of some of the things that we, we do to support artists in our, in our sector. Um, but there are three strands to our work, three main strands. The first is artistic residencies. The second uh, is professional development training and supporting artists through learning and teaching. And then the third strand is an outdoor program of work. So events that we present uh, in our local community. So with the artistic uh, residencies program, artists come to stay with us for up to normally two, one to two weeks. Um, so we have 15 accommodation cabins on site here. So uh, companies of 15 or more, when we have two people staying in the same cabin, uh, can come and, and live on site and um, fully immerse themselves in their rehearsal process. Um, this is Cathy Hind, who is a, a sound artist who has come um, a number of times to work in our fabrication workshop to design and make these fantastic sound installations that she installs in botanic gardens and, and other locations. And we have artists from across disciplines. Um, so companies who are making dance, theater, mime, puppetry, sound art, installation art, all kinds of interesting interdisciplinary practices uh, come to, to make work for uh, at 101. Um, and they get, then go off and present their work in the wide range of different environments and contexts that exist within the outdoor arts um, sector within the UK. Um, so that includes festivals, but also town centre events, uh, local small scale touring to, to rural communities through some of the rural touring networks that exist in the UK. Um, companies making work for other site specific contexts. So that might be woodlands or old, you know, disused swimming pools or factories, uh, artists making work in the landscape or, or in, other, um, in other interesting and un unusual and creative contexts. 
this was a company called Earthbound who came to us a few weeks ago to develop new ideas for a show about plastic pollution and plastic waste. Uh, fusing theatre, storytelling and uh, circus performance. They, um, you can see there that they were presenting a live stream. So this is something that's evolved um, through the pandemic, something that we always thought was a great possibility here. We're in the middle of England. It's quite difficult for lots of people to get to us very easily. We're sort of more in, a, in the countryside. And so actually delivering a programme of di di digital sharings has been really successful and companies have been able to invite quite, you know, quite significant numbers of people to watch a digital sharing of their work uh, whilst they've been in the building. So that's a great outcome of the last year that we're going to continue to, to develop and support artists in, in creating. But yeah, so a very, di very diverse and broad range of different types of companies coming together and wanting to use our facilities. Um, you know, it's lovely. This was a, a, a collaboration between Upswing and Unlimited, uh, two national organisations who came together to do some very early R&D, some very, very initial experimentation, uh, looking at um, XR, so looking at VR and augmented reality and how that might, how they might be able to combine those technologies um, with an interesting outdoor uh, circus theatre presentation. So just very early experimentation. Other companies come just to use the workshop, so just to design and fabricate. We have a lead artist here, Martin West, who's a fantastic metal worker and engineer. And so artists can come and, and design and craft uh, their the work with him. Uh, this is Lou. We have a resident chef who, uh, who, who companies can, can pay separately to cater for them whilst they're here, which is a brilliant extra offer. Um, you know, companies coming and having this fully immersive, fully catered residency experience really enhances um, their, their experience here, I think. It means there's no arguing over who does the washing up. Although, of course, that, that can also be quite a useful thing to, to learn as a company. So this is our fabrication workshop. Um, so we have lots of yeah, lots of uh, equipment for for metalworking and, and woodworking specifically. That's Martin designing some uh, portable battery powered PA systems uh, for us to use as part of our Festival of Light this year. Uh, this is the team. Uh, so we're a team of six people that support the facility. We have um, a strategic lead, a producer. Um, we have administration and technical support and, and housekeeping as well. Uh, so we're a very, very busy team um, managing the building here. This was a, a pumpkin workshop that we ran with the Corn Exchange Learning and Participation Team. So often we open our doors and invite the local community in to, to work with us as well. So our residency programme is, is offered uh, for free. So artists do not pay to come and rehearse and live here and use our facilities. Um, that's included as part of our, um, our status as a national portfolio organisation, so funded by Arts Council England to deliver this on this programme of residencies for artists. Um, outdoor artists who, who often don't have their own spaces, you know, typified by being small companies who, who often tour and traditionally don't tend to have their own um, you know, their own spaces or their own venues in their local areas, not, not always, but but for a lot of the smaller companies. And so having, having a, a centre here and other similar to other creation spaces in the UK, you know, we provide this, this really needed um, space and opportunity for artists to be able to really develop their ideas, um, uh, come together and, and make work. Um, we do have one funded strand of residencies called the Seedbed Residency Scheme, where we support artists with cash as well as um, the facilities and additional support here as well. And this is uh, an artist called Ling Tan, um, who is developing a, a piece of work that uses these interactive um, sound and light tubes and recording stories with audiences um, and involving them participatory in, in the in the experience of the piece as well. And we supported her th throughout the year um, to develop her ideas, to think about to different contexts, um, and then specifically to come to 101 for a residency where we brought in a, lots of participants for her to experiment on and test out her ideas. Um, so supporting her in a, a slightly more in involved way to develop that, that piece. Um, the seedbed, Residency scheme, we're very interested in supporting artists whose voices might be underrepresented in the arts um, and also where companies are making work 
um, outdoors for the first time. So we're perhaps an established artist who has a practice in, in other contexts, in gallery or theatre or dance contexts, but has never worked in the outdoors or in public space. Um, you know, this strand of work is specifically designed to support and facilitate them in taking those first steps into making work for the outdoors. Um, we can offer lots of advice and support in terms of thinking through all of the additional elements that you have to think about working outdoors on a dramaturgical level, um, from a producing level, and then also from practical making, making something, you know, safe and viable and, uh, you know, e economical to, to be touring for the outdoors as well. Um, so alongside the artistic residencies, we have this ongoing programme of professional development training and labs that we run in partnership with a wide range of other um, national organisations. Um, so in the past, we've run, um, so for example, a director's lab with a theatre company called Improbable, bringing together outdoor artists uh, who, who direct to talk about their practice over three days. We've run an, uh, an all-female acro balance lab with a, a wonderful uh, circus company called Mimbre, which was brilliant, which was about supporting, um, uh, oh, I've just forgotten the word, but then uh, the women that hold, the people that hold people up, bases, that's it, supporting female bases because they'd identified that there were, there weren't very many female bases and actually there's something about the training process in circus where females were not finding that they were getting the same level of opportunities to be the, the, the strong support um, and to be bases and so they wanted to bring together women from across the world actually and we had 30, 30 artists here over a, an extended week, so seven day lab to come together to, to, do, to do that. And we've also just completed a green production managers lab uh, run in conjunction with Without Walls to bring together production managers and technicians to talk specifically about the environmental sustainability agenda to come together as a, as a collective, uh, consider what they can do to, you know, to improve their own practices and also collectively what we can be doing as a sector to, to help make all of our work much more environmentally um, sound and responsible. And this is an image from um, uh, a, a lovely lab uh, run by Upswing recently, which was for artists who identify as black and female uh, to come together to do, it was, again, it was a seven day lab of peer to peer learning and sharing, uh, which was really fantastic. Um, and all of these uh, these artists wanted to come together to talk about politics and identity and what it's like for them making work at this current moment and coming out of the current uh, out of the uh, you know out, out of COVID and the pandemic and the political uh, context that we've seen recently um, and to to develop their own work and find new ways of working together, which um, we think was one of the first labs of its uh, of its kind, which was a fantastic thing. We were very proud that they um, that they wanted to come and. and do that with us. Uh, so we often work with creative producers. This is Sud Basu, who created a, a seedbed residency for us, bringing in external facilitators who are specialists in their field uh, to, to, to come and support the artists who are, who are making work. Um, this is the Forestry Commission who came in to talk to uh, one of our labs, um, one of our lab groups about making work in um, in woodland and forestry settings throughout the UK and she was able to share with them all of the the, um, the application processes and the commissioning and how that whole process works of of touring artworks into forestry and uh, woodland settings. Um, there's some projection mapping on a bear and uh, yeah we often I think one of, one of the lovely things about 101 is is that we're we're in this you know we're in this setting where you can't really walk to many places. We're, we're, we've got Greenham Common just on the corner, uh, just up the road. This lovely, big common area. So there's some nice walks around the area. But because we're we're not near a, a large city or a town, when artists come here, they're a little bit isolated. Um, and so when we do the labs, we I think when we do the residential retreats, we're always competing with um, really nice, beautiful houses in the countryside. You know, with hot tubs. For these residential retreats so we, we like to offer things like yoga and nice food and walks on the common to try and um, compensate for the fact that it's a bit of a cold a cold warehouse sometimes but a beautiful space a creative space anyway 
and of course lovely food with with Lou as well and here's an image from our festival of light which we uh, present every year as an annual community lantern procession in our in our local um, local town which is Newbury and we've just had uh, we've been running weekend workshops and we sent lantern packs out to schools uh, 1700 lantern packs have gone out this year to community settings and schools in the local area um, and we'll have about uh, 600 people coming through the building over the next couple of weekends to make lanterns and learn about willow lantern making processes um, to take part in this annual procession which is taking place on the 12th of December it's very soon actually lots to do um, where we'll see probably 3,000 people coming together to walk together uh, holding these these lanterns we're one of the last remaining candle lit lantern processions in the in the UK um, as well uh, many of them have moved over to LEDs um, and we are we're holding on dearly to the the beauty of enabling children to walk down the road with uh, with a candle in their in their hand as well um, but it's an ongoing application so if you want to apply for a, an artistic residency at 101 you can it's a very simple process you can send us an email or give us a call or you can send me an email directly and please do if you want to find out any more information about um, about 101 and and how we might be able to support you or to share some ideas for your project and to think together about how we might make that work and we'd love to, to welcome you here for, for a residency and hear more about your project. And we have a rolling program, a rolling application process throughout the year. So you can email us at any time and uh, we will then begin a conversation, um, you know, at any point, you know, a year before your project, or even if you're suddenly coming to the UK and you, you know, you want to come and have a couple of days or come and have a look around, we will try and, and make that work for you as well. Um, so yeah, I think that's the main, the main gist. How am I doing for time, Hannah? That was almost spot on. <laughs> exactly the right amount of time. Thank you so much for that, Danielle. That was super interesting. Lots of information there. And we will be sharing the images and slides with everybody um, after the session today. And um, also very useful for everybody to note that there is an invitation there to connect with Danielle. And um, so I'll post her email in the chat. Um, and that you can contact at any time without waiting for a structured open call or uh, application opportunity to reach out to 101 and see whether there might be opportunities. So lovely open offer there to consider. Okay, so I'm gonna move us on quite quickly um, to Angus McKechnie from Outdoor Arts UK. Um, and then after that, we'll take a few minutes just to have a brief pause and uh, share any immediate questions uh, after our first two speakers. So, Angus, um, if you'd like to share your screen. I will in a moment. Sorry, I've got this issue at the moment. So, uh, <laughs> this is Pipkin. Go away. Love you, but go away. <laughs> and if oh, I no, could just, on the notes. And we can just remind you as well, Angus, just to... Uh, be mindful of the speed at which you speak for our translator. Uh, talking of timing, um, obviously this is break time now, so we're running quite late. Um, do you want me to cut? Uh, I don't mind. I'll, I'll give you a nod sort of at the 10 minute mark. Okay, hello. Um, nice to see you all uh, this morning uh, or this evening. And um, I'll just talk a little bit about uh, a few things that uh, obviously there's quite a lot of crossover with what we're um, what we've been talking about with the with the other speakers uh, but what I thought I'd do is I'd just do kind of another spin you probably had enough of them on what uh, we're terming as outdoor arts in the UK um, so let me just uh, get this and do one of the really groovy screen shares there we go okay so um so Outdoor, Outdoor Arts UK is a networking organisation, but uh, I'll talk about that in a minute and what we do. Um, this question of what are outdoor arts, it's just worth probably reiterating some of this uh, and so talk about a little bit what it's not, because um, when, uh, when you Google street arts, you usually get this, you usually get graffiti, which is a great thing and a really wonderful art form, but not necessarily us. It could also be knitting on a telephone box in central London very much outdoor arts, but again, not necessarily what we're looking at here. It could be a giant inflatable duck on a river. 
And of course, it's Banksy. That's what everybody thinks. I work in the world of Banksy and graffiti. Not the case. So we mean this. We mean performance in outdoor spaces. And I think it's quite interesting. We often use, and we have done a lot today, the phrase public space. It is worth remembering that a lot of the spaces that we talk about are not public. They are either owned by private organizations such as shopping centers or such as um, municipal organizations, um, local authorities actually own those spaces. Public is a bit of a false narrative that, that we need, but it's not necessarily the case. And indeed, quite a lot of the work does end up taking place in festivals, in private spaces, in fields, in stately homes, in large private gardens. Um, and that still is part of the sector and quite an important part, again, for many people who are uh, earning uh, a living through it. Uh, but largely, it's the outdoorsness. Uh, that is in uh, that is a festival in Peckham there, Peckham Munch. Um, we mean events that take place here. This is uh, on Bournemouth seafront, or it's work like this that is much more narrative. Uh, this is taking place on the South Bank. Um, pyrotechnics, big spectacle feature a lot. That's um, that's where I used to work, and that's almost ten years ago. That's when the Olympics. We're here. That's the National Theatre in central London, which used to have an outdoor arts program. Um, we mean this is a dance company. We'll talk about them in a minute. This is them performing in Spain in a festival in Tarraga. Uh, and where? So just talking a bit about that. Often it's in streets, very often in parks, in public squares uh, that may be local authority run spaces, a roof of a car park, on a river, in a town in a major city, that's central London, in a small village, uh, in a field festival, again, would almost always be a private event, um, festivals in high streets or in historic gardens, that again would be a private event, uh, uh, that's a, very much a, a, a touring circuit. Uh, in processional work, quite specifically, some events are simply processions, not, not festivals in that sense, but there are carnivals which also take place in streets and mellows which will be again, probably ticketed and to a kind of private crowd. Um, and just in terms of the art form, there's quite a bit of theatre, puppetry. Music is, is obviously a key part of outdoor festivals, um, but there is a large crossover with what we call the outdoor arts sector. Uh, dance features hugely, uh, that was already mentioned uh, by Hannah. Uh, cabaret comes into it, some of the cabaret artists will, will take their work outdoors. Uh, pyrotechnics are a very important part of the work simple plain comedy. In fact, there's quite a few people who sort of more on the comedy circuit, sometimes better outdoors. Disability arts, again, Hannah mentioned this, has a strong place in the outdoor sector. Uh, visual arts has a sort of crossover. This is a very obvious one that has painting in the show, but some of the installation work is from the visual arts world. Um, circus features, lots of circus. Oh, so much circus. Circus is a huge uh, part of, of the, the sector and, and one of the Kind of quite specific areas we probably cross over with a lot. Um, I'm just going to take a little pause there and just because for timing's sake um, and we'll come back to this uh, but what I'll do now is I just think I need to unshare and just bring up the different screen. So I'm just going to take you through, I'm going to use um, our website to take you through a little bit more about the first uh, question we were looking at which is uh, OA UK, Outdoor Arts UK, uh, as an organization uh, and what, what we do. So let me just reshare my screen. Um, and so this, this here is, is, our, is our website, which kind of gives us our identity um, largely. And we have three strands you'll see. One is the public face of Outdoor Arts UK, which is uh, probably largely about us sharing information with the general public, with our audiences, with people who might come and see shows or buy tickets uh, and we run two very distinct social media uh, handles. One is for public information, come and see this show, this is what you'll get, this is who's in it. And then the other side is our professional side, which is very much for the sector and for the artists and for the producers to have a look at opportunities that are available for funding, for work, for R&D, uh, jobs, huge, huge, huge amount of jobs at the moment uh, available in the sector. 
Uh, and those two are very much our, our different strands. And then the third part is our members and what we offer as a network. So primarily, OA UK is a network of um, people working in outdoor arts. And it's really important that as a network, we include artists, and that could be an individual busker working on their own. It could be a large company. Hey, Motion House just popped up on my screen. It could be a large uh, company like that. But included also in the sector is the festivals themselves, is independent producers, is technicians, is health and safety advisors, is agencies, is other organizations such as Extracts uh, who work with, who work in the sector. And so in that sense, as I said yesterday, we're an umbrella to kind of keep everybody in one, one dry place, but we're also a crucible, a bowl where we would hold people and hopefully encourage that networking and we do a lot of work about, largely it's often about us saying, we don't know the answers, but we know the people who do. And that's kind of really strong function of what we do. Um, the other, I mentioned the information. Um, so I, I will just talk about, uh, so this is the public listings. Um, if you can see, does that come up as a change of page? I just, is that okay? Yeah, um, we yeah, can yeah, see that. Yeah. So this will be a long list of what's on now. And I would, if you want to find out what's confirmed, as soon as we get a confirmation, as you can see at the moment, most of them are saying Christmas at various venues because it's that time of year. If I go through to the full page um, of this, this is a rolling updating document. Uh, and this will take us through to what we have here. Bradley will be talking later. GDIF has confirmed its dates. Fira Tarragar in Spain. Here are some going into... Um, uh, September and um, I go back a page. It's just a very. It's as soon as we get it, this is up to date, and this is really good public resource, but actually very good professional report resource to find out what's what's confirmed and going ahead, especially at the moment. Um, very important to 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 know these. For example, that that little listing from out of the time has been sat there for a year because it unfortunately was unable to go ahead last year. Um, and then if I just uh, close that and whiz through, this is the professional version of that. So this is a list, a listing service again for people working in the sector in some form. So this will be at the moment, largely free webinars um, and online events uh, and any other courses or training opportunities that come. We're quite broad in what we select. If it's got a vague cultural interest, it might not be specifically for outdoor arts, but it may have an area. This is, um, for example, this one at the Albany is a pitching session for work that engages the public. It could well be indoors, but it could also be outdoors. So we will include that. We keep that as broad as possible. And um, we're going as far ahead as possible. Um, we'll talk about NASA UK in a minute, um, uh, but they're you know, right the way through to the Tariga Professionals Programme. Um, and in terms of other networking, uh, uh, the, the broader shape of the sector, let me do that. Um, so this is our partners page. Here is the Circus Strada network, which uh, I know extracts uh, as well as us uh, are, are a, a strong um, connection. That's a European and now international network run from France uh, with EU funding, and we're still allowed to be in it despite Brexit. A very useful network, circus and street arts, um, very much the European phrase street arts. Uh, in one organization there, and they do big international conferences alternating between circus and street arts each year. In the UK, we have the Creative Industries Federation, which is a cultural organization uh, that's about making the business case and is quite an important uh, partner during Brexit, um, during a lot of the early discussions once that uh, went through. Uh, we are a member of the Independent Theatre Council, and some of our members are, if they feel they cross over more into the theatre world. Uh, it's quite a broad definition of theatre, uh, but a very useful professional resource, very good on legal matters and contracting. Um, our friends in ISACS, the Irish Street Art Circus and Spectacle Network, um, again, Extracts and uh, ourselves have a very strong relationship with them. Um, they look after Ireland as opposed to Northern Ireland, but they do look after Ireland a bit as well. Um, Carry on touring is something that is a, is a response to Brexit, which is a, a lobbying organisation, which again we've been part of um, in terms of trying to make the case for increased access to the touring market in Europe and vice versa. Um, the other, uh, so the UK, um, Hannah brilliantly kind of summed up the UK and what it means in Great Britain and England and all the rest of it. 
There are other networks. So in Scotland, there is Articulation Scotland, which looks after circus, outdoor arts and spectacle uh, in Scotland. Um, so, so we have a relationship with them. Art and Culture in Wales is, again, a, an umbrella organisation quite specifically, though, for outdoor arts in Wales. Uh, we've worked a little with the Busking Project. This is an area which doesn't come often into the funding world. And we actually reached out to them more during COVID because we had some funding to give anybody working outdoors. And I was very keen that people who were buskers on the street had access to those funds. So um, they, they don't necessarily fit into to the Arts Council, England and, and the other devolved uh, countries funding, but they, they still are an important part of our sector. They are working outdoors. NASA, the National Association of Street Artists, has been going a long time and is a very much an artist organisation. And they are people who are working from the, the street arts perspective, um, creating work, and they have a particularly strong annual gathering, which um, is often hosted at, at 101. Uh, and they get together with artists. I've been along too. Um, I know people in x have been along. It's, it's a, a, a very supportive, but very much artist-led uh, organization. Here, I'm not going to summarize, but I obviously put without walls and extracts as key partners um, in the sector. I'll just mention three more, which is one is Attitude is Everything, which is um, an organization which works on festival access for dis deaf and disabled people, <clears throat> for both artists, but more particularly for audiences, much more in the music festival circuit, but some excellent crossover and really good advice and, and guidance there. The audience agency, um, produce lots of reports across um, sectors about uh, how audiences behave and who they are, but they have included outdoor arts within that. And um, Judy's Bicycle is an organisation looking at environmental sustainability within the cultural sector. Again, they've been partners on many other projects. So I'm just aware of time. So I'm just um, going to just run through these last bits. So here's our members. Um, there are actually, I think, 305 members at the moment. And as you can see, just as I scroll through, they take all sorts of different shapes and forms, companies, individuals, producers, and Upswing is so good, we listed it twice. Um, so that, the, and, and there's like individual producers in there, uh, as, as well as uh, big festivals and companies. Um, and that becomes a key, that listings becomes a key document for us. Our members dive in here. This is the members dashboard uh, for just them. And um, we, we will have things like training discounts in there. But the crucial bit is that we list for the membership. Here's today, this is live. This is the jobs page for offstage jobs. Here are jobs actually, which are, uh, is their deadline today. Uh, and as you can see, there's a lot of jobs out there at the moment. He said quickly, including one with us, Outdoor Arts UK. Are recruiting a general manager at the moment. Um, we keep all of that up to date. We also would tweet all of that information. So that's kind of how we bring it together. What I want to just touch upon um, then briefly is um, uh, uh, advice and guidance. Um, I'll just dive into the COVID page um, at the moment. So that there's there's an image from Brentford Documents International Festival, um, which was on the first out. Here's this is an example of resources. They're very COVID specific. Um, uh, and various web webinars and reports and uh, examples of contracts and things that we did. That, that kind of crosses over. We, but a lot of the advice is live. Um, I, we do one-to-ones with our members and beyond the members. Um, we uh, probably, it's fair to say, it's, if we looked at that, uh, we talked about um, being part of the Carry On Touring. That's very much an advocacy part of our work and doing things that we can to shape the identity through social media of the outdoor arts as a sector, uh, increasingly getting recognized. And then we also, like, a, um, like many organizations, we have an important role in events and meetings, uh, bringing the sector together. A lot of it's been online. Um, we probably will now do a big event later in uh, 2022. Um, I just wanna mention, finally, um, it, 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 there, there's an increasing um, uh, making spaces, creation centers, network coming up, which is great, um, as well as 101, which has led the way for many years. Um, there is the Out There Festival in Great Yarmouth, uh, which has a, a venue called the Drill Hall, which hosts creation spaces. 
Emergency Exit Arts in Greenwich has a, a, a lovely creation space there. Walk the Plank has recently opened a new place called Cobden Works in Salford. Uh, and a big new one that opened recently was the Daimler Powerhouse in Coventry, which was an initiative by Imagineers Productions, um, which has been a, a company creating work in Coventry for many years, has created a, a, a wonderful space. We just went down there, which also hosts kind of office and admin to various companies that have existed out of people's front rooms in Coventry for many, many years. So that's that's uh, great news. Other, just finally, other little bits of um, networking. We talked about light festivals, increasingly part of the sector. When I first came into this job six years ago, we barely, barely acknowledged them. Uh, there's a, there is a network called Light Up the North, which is very good for bringing together installation light work. Uh, and then of course, Carnival Arts Network is, is for the carnival sector, the Mellor partnership for the Mellor sector. But I think as well, we should acknowledge that Extracts 101, Emergency Exit Arts, all do, do events and networking uh, opportunities for the sector in their own kind of different ways. Um, because of time, I will stop sharing and won't do me, um, here's my view of some in English and other UK companies, but uh, we, I'll turn the slides on, just have a look at some other pictures. Uh, and I'll hand back to Hannah. Thank you so much, Angus. There's so much information there to be gained from the Outdoor Arts UK website, and um, they do an amazing job of keeping all of that information up to date um, with all of the listings and events. Um, I have to say that events crop up on there on the list before they've even been publicly <laughs> announced sometimes, so they're really on it. Um, in terms of keeping that information, which is such a useful resource for the sector. Um, and also if you're trying to um, navigate and understand what events are, are happening out there, this is a really great place to start. Um, Angus also showed the COVID-19 resources page, um, which has lots of useful templates. Um, as we have been um, uh, able to kind of go ahead with performances this summer that means that we have developed quite a lot of useful tools um, which might be interesting to companies looking to create work um, in the Covid context. Um, so I think we are running a little bit behind our scheduled timing um, partly because of my technical <laughs> issues earlier uh, could I just, I just want to invite very quickly um, any immediate questions and if there aren't any, then we'll just move to a short five minute break um, and then come back and hear from our other speakers and then use the remaining time left to have um, more opportunity for questions. So is there anybody, first of all, who would like to um, ask either Angus or Danielle anything at this point? No, great, okay. So uh, let's move and just have a, a short break. Um, so please feel free to turn your cameras off, get up, move around, stretch, <laughs> um, get yourself a, a drink. Um, and if you could join us again, we'll start again at 10 past um, 10 in our time, which is uh, 10 past seven in Korean time. Thank you so much. Hi, Angus. Can you hear me? I just wanted to, um, just briefly while we're on the break, I just wanted to just... Got you. Hello. Would you just be able to let me know if you can see this um, mm -hmm. screen sharing? <laughs> just, um, just... Okay. Right. Um, does that, what, what can you see there? Can you see... Is it I've got it says presenter view, so I'm not actually seeing the slide. I'm seeing your uh, view at the moment, if that makes sense. Yeah. 
Okay. All right. That's I've cool. got I've got your view. Mm, what a pain. Um, um, oh, because you've got notes. Yeah, you've got speaker notes at the side. Yeah, I can see them. So that, right. would, that would ruin all your surprises. I know. I might just have to do it though. Cause... Anyway, all right. Thank you. Nice to see you. I know, I've only seen you at a distance. I've been waving at you under the giant <laughs> puppet for weeks. I know. What a time, eh? Yeah, um, crazy. Yeah, it'd be good to catch up. We should catch up at another point. Yeah, no, that's good. Well, it seemed, it, it's, it, I mean, it seemed to go really well. It seemed to go really well by the time we reached it in London. Yeah, it was good. It was, um, it was all of the things, but it was pretty amazing in the end. Yeah. Um, right. But yeah. All right, I'll see you in a moment. All righty. Amaya, if you if you can hear me, just um, okay. for you to know that if you um, save your presentation as a PDF yes. and then you have it open as a PowerPoint as well, you could share the slides in the PDF and then look at the PowerPoint notes, I think, <laughs> if that makes sense. Yeah, I've done it so many times with, <laughs> and I always forget. <laughs> yeah. Comes back to the next presentation. It's so I'm here fun. if you want to try it quickly. All right, great. Let me just, um, that's great, actually. I'll just, just I'll see if that works. It sometimes just depends on how many monitors you have as well, doesn't it? Which is a bit of a nightmare, but see. It's just so frustrating, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Like, oh, I've done all the notes. Oh, no, I'm just not going to um, be able to use it. <laughs> yeah. It was a PDF. Yeah. Great. Okay. And then... I'm here. So if I go share screen and then files. Yeah, see if that works. We're just checking if um if Amaya can share her presentation without uh, while also looking at her notes, Hannah. I would try and share it as a PDF, maybe. Yeah, that's what she's doing, yeah. And um, also, um, I just I just responded to your message just to say we'll we'll still aim to finish at eleven. We won't run late. We'll just maybe reduce some of the time for discussion. But perhaps I might just ask you and Bradley with your videos if we post them in the chat rather than streaming them. That might save a bit of time. Would you be happy with that? Um, uh, uh, um I think mine might not make that much sense without sharing okay. a bit of mine. Um, so I might just share a bit of it. Um, okay. I won't run over. Can you see that? Uh, I can see that you shared your screen. I it's just blank at the moment for me though. Blank. <laughs> uh, yeah. It's weird. All right, I give give up on it. Maybe. Um... <laughs> <laughs> Technology is getting the best of us today. <laughs> <laughs> It's not working. The last, the last thing I was going to try is maybe one of you could share it and then I could have my notes. Do you want to send me the PDF? Well, maybe not me, actually, because my PDF failed. Maybe if you could email it to um, Irene. Do you think yeah, go for it. I'll yeah. put my email in the chat yeah. just now. Maya. Yeah, that sounds great. Um, OK, I think everybody's starting to come back. Welcome back, everybody. Um, do turn your cameras on so I can see that you're here. <laughs> I always feel strange just speaking out into a, a screen. <laughs> I hope everybody managed to get a quick break. It's a very good idea to have a break from the screen for your eyes and well-being. Okay, so um, without any further delay, I'm going to ask Bradley if he's ready and happy to share his um, presentation. So for this, I think Sue is going to be presenting slides. So are you ready to share screen, Sue? And Bradley, I have your video link here, so I'll pop that one in the chat just now. So yeah, over to Bradley. Good evening, everybody. Um, wonderful to be here. Um, the picture you're looking at there uh, was from Greenwich and Docklands International Festival four years ago. Um, it's a performance of uh, The Border of the Water, The Song of the Wind, a really beautiful uh, performance that came to London 
um, from creative group Zumbi uh, and was part of a wider program of work by Korean artists, uh, which we presented that year. I think it's a great picture because it shows one of the values of the festival, which is to try and create some real um, magic and uh, dynamism between the artistic vision of the artists that we work with and the place in which we set, we set the work. So you're looking here at the performance um, from creative group Thumbi framed by a view across the whole of London from where the festival takes place in Greenwich. Uh, you can see out from this hill across the whole of the capital, which gave it, I think, added resonance. Can we go to the next slide, please? So festival.org, we're a year round outdoor arts producing organization based in London uh, with a very small team of six people who are employed throughout the year. Our portfolio includes ongoing producing work and recently touring throughout the year. We also coordinate the Global Streets Network. Global Streets is an Arts Council funded consortium of 12 different organisations who are committed to presenting work by international artists in 12 different places around the country. I'm going to come on to talk more about Global Streets later on, but it's a really wonderful project and has been, I'm very proud to say, continuing its work throughout the pandemic by adapting and finding new ways of presenting international work. We also undertake consultancy work, uh, by which I mean we use our same skills and expertise in running our outdoor arts projects at Global Streets and at Greenwich and Docklands International Festival to commission for other organisations. So for example, at the moment, we're getting ready to present an installation by the Swiss artist Dan Ache at Guildhall Yard in the city of London as a project that's being commissioned by the Mayor of London as part of a winter programme which is designed to reopen London as we emerge, as we hope to be emerging from the pandemic. And then lastly, and this is I think probably where um, extracts have invited me to speak at most, the Greenwich and Docklands International Festival, which is an annual festival of outdoor arts, which takes place annually uh, in Greenwich and East London. The festival took place in 2020. We were the first festival, as Angus mentioned, that was able to take place um, following the first phase of the pandemic in August 2020. And we've recently completed uh, our 2021 edition. And the video um, that Hannah has just circulated will give you a flavour of the sort of work that we present. Next slide, please. Sorry, could I have the part? Oh, thanks. So um, I'm going to talk a little about the kind of international work that we're looking to present. Sorry. Am I, am I back on? Were you hearing me before? Uh, we lost you for one second, Bradley, but we can right. really now. Okay, great. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm going to talk a little about programming priorities across Global Streets and Greenwich and Docklands International Festival. Global Streets, as I mentioned, is a consortium with 12 different partners made up of art centres, festivals, and local authorities from across England. Many of them work in places where there's lower um, representation by local people in the, the artists 
um, the, the, the arts presented in the area or where there are underrepresented groups um, in local communities, places that are experiencing economic and social disadvantage. So when we're looking at international work, we're looking for things that I describe as being permeable. By permeable, I mean things that audiences and participants can engage in and also potentially shape. So in the images there, you can see uh, the building with the frame structure on the top and a person standing in the doorway there. Um, this is an artwork uh, from a Belgian choreographer called Joanne Leighton. It's called the Hull Vigil. Uh, and it's an architectural structure that sits on top of um, a tall building in Hull. And every morning and every night for 365 days, uh, a representative of Hull, a local person, stands in vigil watching over the city. At certain points, there are rituals and events that take place beneath the whole vigil. But this is a program that's caused a huge amount of local interest, of engagement and pride in the city of Hull. So it's an example of that sort of permeable work. And also I think very interesting in the context of both the pandemic and in terms of the global climate emergency, that this is something that we can create with an international artist and international designers, but without necessarily having to move international artists and objects and set across borders. So it's a very useful model to think about. We're also at Global Streets looking for work which re resonates in terms of contemporary themes and concerns. So um, particularly following COP26 um, earlier in November, we are very mindful of, um, of engaging in climate change in a meaningful way. And the artwork that you see at the top left here, uh, Dan Ashe's We Are Watching toured to a number of global street cities before heading to Scotland for the COP26 Global Summit. It's a giant eye made up of thousands of selfies and portraits and invocations to global leaders in Glasgow to affect the changes that are necessary. So coming on to GDIF, um, our programme takes place over a very wide area. It includes a programme of theatre, dance, circus, and recently um, much more durational installation work and that's arisen out of the pandemic. We found that presenting those large scale uh, performances in public squares that might last for 40 minutes and draw an audience of 5,000 people in the current circumstances are much less sustainable. So we've been focusing much more on nighttime and indeed daytime installations to which people can safely come over a longer period of time. We're always interested uh, in very accessible work, work that's visually striking. And also we're trying where possible to make the festival distinctive by presenting things that people feel that they really must see and productions that might premiere in the UK. Okay, could I have the next slide, please? So, um, in terms of our approach to the programme at GDIF, London is a uniquely globally connected city, and the boroughs in which we work, in Greenwich and East London, are profoundly diverse and represent people who from from countries all over the world. So, for us, as we approach the programming, it's very important that we reflect the people and we engage with the people of East London and we tell the story of the place in which the festival takes place. So the festival really belongs to East London. Um, there are aspects of the festival 
which are always there every year. We have a program of outdoor arts with a very family focused appeal called the Greenwich Fair. It's like a festival within the festival, which takes place in our World Heritage Site in Greenwich. We run a two day program of outdoor contemporary dance at Canary Wharf called Dancing City. And the company that you're looking at at the bottom there, uh, Modern Table, performed at Dancing City in 2017. As I say, installations are increasingly important for us following the pandemic. So too, uh, and Hannah referred to this earlier on, are performances which take place at very local level so that people don't have to travel very far to see the work. It's work that happens on their doorsteps and it's work that engages with audiences who may not normally attend the arts. The other thing um, that is important for the festival is narrative. We're very keen to tell stories and uh, that becomes an increasingly strong focus for us as we go forward through these particularly difficult times. I'm going to go slightly faster now just to mention um, two models. We're currently in a two-year cooperation agreement with the Ministry of Culture in Flanders and developing a strong focus on Flemish work uh, for 2022 at present. We really like working in this way so that we can really dig down and embed relationships within the festival much more. And this was very much the case back in 2017, when, as I mentioned, we worked with Extract to develop a focus on Korea. Uh, so then if we move on to the final slide, please. I'm not going to spend so long on this because much of this has been covered really well by Angus and ha Hannah. But I will say um, that um, it's useful to know that the Arts Council, who are the main funding agency uh, for outdoor arts in the UK, have published a 10-year strategy called Let's Create, which focuses on three main outcomes, on enabling people in the UK to fulfil their creativity, about creative people. It's also about embedding culture in local places, in places where perhaps culture doesn't traditionally happen. But there's also a big focus on the UK as a creative country. And I think that's what's really interesting for this conversation, because following Brexit, there is a strong imperative to develop uh, collaborative relationships with artists and producers across the world it's uh, an exercise in what's often called here soft power. And I think that there's a real appetite on the part of the UK government to see much more of this work happening. So I wanted to say, my final words were really to say that the door uh, is very much open at GDIF, globalstreetsandfestival.org. And we look forward to continuing this conversation. Thank you. That's brilliant. Thank you so much, Bradley. Um, and some really lovely examples of the festival, which you can see if you watch the video um, I've posted in the chat just there. Um, <laughs> great. Thank you so much. So we just have one final speaker with us today, and that is Amaya Dent, who is an independent creative producer. So Amaya, I'm going to um, just check whether you're sharing your screen or if you've got your slides. And um, I'm going to share something briefly okay. and then there will be slides. So, am I, if I can just ask you to kind of keep within your time and then we'll, we should have about 20 minutes left for questions. So uh, I'll send you a message to wrap up um, so you don't have to keep an eye on the clock. <laughs> that sounds, that sounds good. I'll set a time at my end as well, just in case. Okay. Um, so hi, hello everybody. Thanks for having me. I'm Amaya. I am a producer, a creative producer here in the UK. Um, I have worked internationally, nationally, um, but I am London based. Um, and I have just finished working on a large scale international project called The Walk. And um, I'm going to show you a brief video 
and then I'll stop it so because we don't have a huge amount of time so um, if you just bear with me <coughs> um, Can you see the Vimeo window? Um, I don't think I can, actually, Amaya. Okay. Well, maybe don't worry about it then. It's a bit classic, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to maybe post, share the link with me and we can pop it in the chat? Yeah, I'll do that instead. Um... Okay, here we go. I'll put it in for everybody and then maybe people can watch it in their own time. Um, do you want to share, would you mind um, sharing my presentation slides? That'd be all right. <clears throat> Thanks so much. Um, so, um, I've just, you'll, you can watch the video afterwards, but I have just finished working on this project called The Walk. The Walk was an international travelling festival of art and hope, which was centred around a young woman, a nine and a half year old girl, a Syrian unaccompanied minor refugee um, who was in search of her mother and walking across many countries along a route that many thousands of refugees take almost daily um, in search of hope and in search of a, a, a better and easier future. And little Amal um, is, was also a giant puppet, a three and a half meters tall puppet um, operated by four. Um, and yeah you can you can watch some footage of her afterwards i think you would enjoy seeing it um could we have the next slide please um i'm just going to talk a little bit about um why i love working in the outdoor arts sector and just trying to set the scene a little bit of what the sector um feels like here to me my experience of it um as an independent producer um uh, the outdoor art sector here is incredibly diverse. It's the most diverse art form that we have here in the UK. Um, we've talked about the fact that lots of things happen um, in public space, or at least in open space, and uh, in spaces like the streets and shopping centres and parks that everybody has access to. Um, and what is amazing about that is the fact that you get very um, off the cuff, curious interaction with the work. Um, people will come round the corner from the shops and experience something that they didn't know was going to be there. Um, and the reason that I like working in, you know, in this sector as opposed to any other is that you get that honesty of response from audiences and also we can take outdoor work to the places in which people live, work and play um, as opposed to putting on the art in spaces that are culturally renowned. Um, and there is an amazing removal of obstacles. We can put on work for free. Um, we can, it can mean that people don't necessarily have to travel um, or have to go into buildings or spaces that might be intimidating. Um, I'll have the next slide, please. Um, very briefly, it's important to say that, uh, you know, the outdoor arts, um, what's amazing about it also is that in this country it is black and brown owned more than any other sector and um, our two biggest um, events that that happen outdoors on the streets we have Notting Hill Carnival um, 
which has drawn audiences of up to 2 million, happens on the streets in West London um, and is a, a black led, um, Caribbean led, but black, black British led affair. Um, and we have uh, another incredible celebration, Boy Shaki Mela, um, a Bangladeshi celebration that happens, um, it happens nationally and internationally, but one of the biggest celebrations happens in Bangla town in Tower Hamlets um, and draws audiences of around 80,000. Um, and for me, I am mixed race, I am Sri Lankan British, and for me, having incredible diversity um but really good representation of different the different ethnic groups that call the uk home is absolutely important to my work and that is another reason why the outdoor art sector in this country is amazing um next slide please um that uh this is just a quick picture of a group of lollipop people who were um, forming a, a section of a big carnival procession in Newham, Newham Carnival, um, which I love because I just feel like it's a brilliant snapshot of, of a, a mixed community. Um, and I think it's important to say that also when we make these magic happenings happen where people live and work and play, what we can do is we can help to shape or transform the psychogeography um, of these spaces. And by that, I mean the memories that people have associated with the places that they live out there every day. And in, um, in many places, uh, you know, as Bradley said, places where there might be disadvantage or poverty, or it can feel like the place that you live is not a place where anything positive ever happens. Bringing this work outside somebody's house can just have a, a magical and transformative effect about how people feel about where they live. Um, and so that, yeah, that's, you know, some more. Um, next slide, please. Um, just briefly, uh, this is a dance performance that happened just last month on Trafalgar Square. Um, <clears throat> this is Little Amal in, in the picture. Um, and with her are a, a black-led British London, very East London-led dance company, Boy Blue, who do extraordinary work with young people, training them up as dancers um, and this is the cohort of all volunteer dancers who learnt this amazing routine to celebrate Amal's birthday in London. Um, next slide. <clears throat> um, so um, this is a key question um, you know following on from what I've just said um, I think one of the key questions facing the outdoor sector right now something very topical uh, is, you know, the pandemic um, has posed and continues to pose huge obstacles to, um, to art forms such as Carnival and Mela, um, black and brown led celebrations that happen in the streets um, with, you know, things like social distancing being really important to keep people safe these events where numbers are difficult to regulate and where things are unticketed, um, it, it, these regulations and the current climate pose a real challenge to how these uh, celebrations can continue to thrive. Um, and that's a, that's a really big thing facing us currently. The Notting Hill Carnival has not happened for the last two years and uh, it's really important to, um, for us to find ways to strengthen and um, protect these spaces post pandemic. Um, so that's a, that's a reflection that many, many people are doing lots of thinking on now. Um, next slide, please. Oh, this is just a, a brief 
um, another thing that's fantastic about um, working in the outdoor arts in the UK is the huge variety of spectacular landscapes that can be worked in. This is the White Cliffs of Dover. Um, amazing setting. Um, and right by the sea, so you can only work on this particular spot when the tide is out, which is, you know, working in the elements um, is a, a key part of what we do and that just makes our work feel so much more alive often than if, if you are in a sort of black box environment where, where the, the whole thing is more controlled. Um, oh, I've lost my timer. Um, next slide, please. Um, this is a photo from a festival in Thamesmead, an area of South East London. Um, and really the, the point I wanted to make here is just going back to that thing about um, unexpected reactions happening um, when you are working in a situation where you you don't know which audience will turn up um, in in lots of detail and you don't know how people respond and the massive amount of joy that can come from that environment as well as things sometimes being more unpredictable than they might in other settings too. Um, next slide please. Um, and the next one, actually, um, um, sorry, I'm aware of time, so I'm, I'll just, um, skip forward a little bit. Um, so this is a, this is a sculpture. Have you got the sculpture in front of David Castle? Is that what you can see? I'm just double checking. Yes, that's right, Amaya. Yeah. Right. Um, just very briefly, the reason that this picture is important is because this is a large scale sculpture that was built by a um, Syrian artist collective called UV Lab. Um, these artists define as refugees. They no longer live in Syria. They are based respectively in Paris and Istanbul. Um, we brought them to the UK for this commission as part of the walk. The sculpture was built on site at Dover Castle, which is the second most visited tourist attraction in the UK. Uh, the reason that this image is so important to me is because um, many, many of the things that people say about Dover are about hostility um, and anti-refugee feeling. Um, you may know that, uh, you know, Kent is often at the forefront of refugees arriving in the UK. Um, and so this is just an example of an amazing creative collaboration uh, that was just so uh, rich and positive for everybody involved and against all odds um, and against these, the sort of socio-political context. This, this project was a huge success and thousands actually of local Dover community came out to support. Next slide please. This is just some of them with their star lanterns. We ran a very big community program around this. Um, and the next slide please. This photo, this was an accidental photo taken. It wasn't, wasn't posed and it's just um, something I think very representative of, of the diversity of the UK outdoor art scene in this. These are, are two artists uh, Khaled and Mike, both Syrian, both defining as refugees, with the mayor of Dover who is welcoming them and thanking them for their work. And they were in residence in Dover for two weeks, building with local people. Um, and I just want to move on from that to the next slide, just into my final two reflections which are and, and questions really, which are very topical now. The first is thinking of um, COVID, but also of, of the climate and climate chaos. Um, you know, there is <clears throat> there, 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 there is a, a push really and a steady moving of really thinking about, um, you know, if, if artists are going to be able to, to travel from further afield less in the interest of trying to protect the climate, if it's going to be harder um, to really bringing as many international artists from far away, then how can we ensure that artists from the global south um, are going to be really as represented as they should be um, on the UK's outdoor art stage? 
um, because um, it's absolutely it's key that these that this work is bought here and that they, these stories are told um, and you know because it will help us here in the UK to uh, to have an improved sense of understanding of these key global conversations around climate change and around so much else um, so that that's another kind of key question of our time in the outdoor sector here um, I'll skip I'll skip the last if you just go to the last slide and I can share the presentation with you and you can explore the rest because I'm short on time um, very briefly I've just put in some good sources of support some links here some places that I go that are rich resources um, uh, and will be good for support and really good for you better understanding the lay of the land in uh, in the UK um, and so uh, I think I, I will I will wrap up there. Thank you. Um, thanks for having me. Um, my next uh, role is that I'm going to be. Um, I've just started actually at Lyft at London International Festival of Theatre, um, and I will share that link as well because they are very interesting to have a good explore of. Um, so yes, thank you all. Thank you, Amaya. That's brilliant and really interesting to get a brief snapshot of some of the projects that you've been working on here in the UK. Um, okay, so I think that leaves us in around 15 minutes to just open up the discussion um, and invite any questions. Um, this is an opportunity whilst we have our, our brilliant speakers here with us. Um, if there was anything that you wanted to ask <coughs> them um, following their presentations, then um, I'll just kind of invite you to to come forward now. So please just raise your hand. Um, yeah, if everybody, if you'd be able to turn your cameras on, it'd be great just to see who we have in the room. Hello. <laughs> Okay, well, um, maybe I'll just open that discussion because I was just reflecting there. I think Amaya's last kind of reflection about the issues in the sector is, an, is a really interesting one. And they are global issues that we're considering. So we've talked across the presentations today about the slightly uncertain circumstances we are now in, in terms of, um, you know, the climate crisis, COVID-19 and and here across Europe, um, navigating the challenges for, um, for us following Brexit. And this all presents a threat um, and a challenge to continuing international working. So I just wondered if any of our speakers might just have one thought that they could share about how you see international collaboration continuing in 2022 and, and the future. How do you think that we can continue these these relationships in different ways? I can come in with a um, a quick point uh, on that, Hannah. I think um, it's been really what's been really interesting is seeing the number of companies and artists coming through One Hundred and One, um, talking about wanting to make work that's socially engaged, wanting to make work that makes a difference, that helps to make the world a better place. You know, political contexts have always been of interest to all artists, you know, and for many artists that make work on the street, you know, challenging conventions and challenging the norm has always been very good source material. Um, but particularly at the moment, artists wanting to really think about the systems and the processes the ways that they're making work, who they're making work with, and the impact, you know, this word impact, the impact of the work that they're making, trying to analyze that and to make the world, world have, the work have greater impact um, is, is definitely prevalent. I mean, almost like 85% of companies coming through are having those conversations at the moment. So what's really interesting is this, the networks and the formation of collective ideas, you know, that actually there are, there are, uh, you know there's better strategic collective thinking happening and so what's very exciting is to have these networks now and to have met you all today and I wonder whether there are ways in which um, you know we can share some of those networks and that collective thinking and whether Hannah that we can tap in and use the green production managers 
lab and some of the collective thinking that's happened there, whether we can extend that out to this cohort and find out whether there are similar um, projects and ventures, I suppose, and where, you know, what the opportunities might be for sharing the knowledge and getting that collective thinking, because we're only going to be able to make a difference if we can unite and create cohesive strategies for change, essentially. Um, so yeah, that was more just a, a thought around the opportunities of this uh, of this meeting, really. Absolutely, and we'll be um, looking at ways that we can kind of continue to connect people following this program. And um, there's already so much available online that we can share to kind of kickstart some of those conversations and resources that have been produced already. Um, I just wanted, I think Pierre had his hand up, so um, I just wanted to invite Pierre to speak if you had a question. I mean, it was uh, around that point. I mean, I, th I guess the <clears throat> that's what uh, uh, one of the speakers said yesterday, but we, the UK and Korea obviously are two opposite sides of the world. So obviously that's the, the question, where, you know, we um, how, how to make it happen. And I mean, obviously people talk about digital arts and all of this kind of things and for me I think it's a great option but it's it's not enough I mean I think a lot of artists are still very kind of physically based and it has to be seen live um, so I guess the other options I mean I guess my question is more around for the works that have been invited here how much have they taught because I think if you bring obviously a company over it's what makes it worthwhile is if they stay like one month two months you know and tour around and do residencies and and where there's a, a whole kind of package of, of things where you and that's in, in this way it makes kind of more sense to pay for flight tickets and, and all of those kind of things so um, i mean i think bradley was mentioning this company that that came um, i mean the thing is i mean obviously i love it you know i mean that's what's beautiful in london when we have this this chance like this luck to have like a korean festival and suddenly you have like a range of companies coming in it, it's fantastic i mean it feels so so lucky but i'm just like how sustainable is that in the future for example yeah it's a it's a big um difficult question um however i mean i personally believe that the exchange of people to share new ideas and culture and art forms is very very important and should continue um, so I don't think we should be discouraging it, but obviously just exploring new models to make sure that, as you say, those decisions take into consideration working in more conscious ways and, yeah, more worthwhile trips. So that idea, Pierre, of building a longer experience when you're touring, I think is a really sustainable approach to say, how can you have the most impact um, and build the make the most of your time in a in a country so that's um kind of what one of our thinking uh, which i mentioned in my presentation earlier is considering what else you might be able to do um rather than just focusing on trying to book one big festival performance for example um, does anybody else have any kind of reflections on that or indeed anything else um, and i should also mention we have sim here and if anybody needs um, translation. Yunju, hello. Hi. Um, well, um, as I introduced myself yesterday, I mainly um, create mobile um, game, which is a mobile app. Um, so an audience like individually go around a certain route and experience story. <clears throat> so my work process is pretty different to other, like a physical theater. Um, creation. Um, also, like we always like have conversation or communication with other parts of um, participants or collaborators through online a lot, especially with develop app developers and sound designers. Well, we mainly talk through online. Um, this time um, we worked with um, English voice actors, and we did mostly on Zoom rehearsal, reading and th reading rehearsals and like a one-to-one -one, uh, building of characters, um, mostly online uh, Zoom meetings. And uh, we just reduced down the like an in-person meeting to like a couple of times in the last final rehearsals and re recording. That's how we 
worked and um, possibly that sort of a, but it, I think you have to be a bit open mind with online conversation and then try to like utilize it as much as possible. Otherwise you are going to kind of a, a mentally stop and then kind of a deny um, the possibility of that um, technical part, like a technologist part. And you, 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 you just, you have to just progress with it and then um, just be positive with the, uh, the technical um, barrier of it and find other ways um, to communicate a bit more like a freely and, and, and a bit like deeper with other parts of the um, collaborators. But you can create it, <laughs> whatever, like a, if you have an aim to create some sort of a, like an art um, project, you can do it uh, whatever there is a, like a obstacles in front of you, I guess. I wondered whether, um, just maybe thinking, Bradley, um, kind of your experience as a festival director doing programming for a festival when the opportunities to see live work are limited and how that experience is for you to kind of see that work developing online and, and you know, is that, does that feel like a useful and pragmatic way forward or does it not give you the experience you're looking for? I'd just be interested to hear your thoughts on that. I mean, I think absolutely, Hannah, that we have to use all the tools that are at our disposal to make connections and to learn about each other and to open windows and think of ways of uh, sharing and collaborating. I think, as I was saying, when I talked about Joanne Layton's work, um, <clears throat> there are ways, um, and, and digital and the gaming idea that we've just heard of would be one such way in which, you know, the, the people and the, and the objects, the set, the equipment don't have to move across borders, but the concepts, the ideas and the creativity does. Um, and I think, you know, of course, the live experience is very fundamental uh, to what we do with GDIF with Global Streets. Um, and we are looking at ways of being more sustainable in the way in which work uh, can tour. Uh, so that doesn't mean just touring in England. We have a very close uh, series of relationships, particularly um, in Flanders, but also um, with Paris, uh, whereby we're sharing um, work uh, and, and making a kind of wider uh, touring uh, proposition uh, a possibility. So, um, but these are all, you know, we're all feeling our way in very new territory and we're all uh, learning together. Great, uh, Irene, hello. <laughs> Hi, I was just going to build on that and um, that point actually that Bradley just mentioned just to remind our um, Korean participants that even though the UK is no longer part of the European Union, we are still in Europe. So the proximity with other countries in Europe does kind of um, bring more possibilities in terms of thinking about a sustainable tour. And I think as you were saying, Bradley, there's, you know, the, the outdoor art scene in the UK and in Europe is very well networked. You know, we all kind of know about each other. And I think that's one of the strengths of it. And um, certainly to utilize the connections that exist in the UK to also um, use that as a platform for a wider kind of international strategy is something that I think is crucial when we're considering our environmental responsibility. Sorry, I have a very croaky voice today. I can see as well, there's just a comment from um, Jin that she's just posted in the chat. Hello, Jin. Um, so I think uh, Jim was sort of raising a concern there around, um, you know, the reality for emerging artists having the same access um, to be able to develop their practice and respond to these challenges, um, which I think is a, a useful point to note. But I think a few of our speakers have, have touched on how, um, you know, especially here in the UK, there are a number of organisations working to support entry to the sector for new artists 
and invite new um, art forms and, and development of that practice um, to keep it evolving <laughs> over time. And, and so I think um, programmes which focus on supporting emerging artists are, are very important and identifying resources to do that. I think we do recognise that. Um, I wondered if um, anybody else um, in the room here who perhaps hasn't yet had the opportunity to tour their work internationally might have just any questions that are coming up for you about, you know, how is there anything you, you're worried about there or, or not sure about how to go about that that you think um, we might be able to help answer today? No, and if anybody wanted to, we have our translator with us, if anybody wants to speak in Korean rather than in English. Mm -hmm. I think I just want to say that I think it can be very scary to think about working internationally when you haven't done it. Mm -hmm. And also just to say that it takes a lot of time and that's okay. You know, nobody expects uh, a new company to suddenly be touring internationally straight away. It's a, it's a long process. And I think something that, um, you know, is, is the right way forward is to just start small and start building the connections with events like this one and attending showcasing events and kind of, you know, different opportunities to connect with people to then understand where your work might sit better. Um, but yeah, I just wanted to acknowledge that I understand it can sometimes feel a little bit daunting and that's okay. Yeah, I think we we all welcome the, the sort of questions that you think might be obvious, but we're here to, to answer them, really. <laughs> Danielle, did you want to come in there? Well, just on that sort of trying to find like positive ways through some of the minefields at the moment. And we had a conference this week with artists, you know, talking about the complexities of making work that's environmentally sustainable and the compromises and, you know, and how we might need to just think very, very differently about the way that we're making work, you know, we're going to have to make massive compromises and re, you know, re change the way we're working to create this systemic change. But there was a, an artist who was very optimistic and was inviting those opportunities and felt very, um, you know, motivated by having sort of a just a different approach with, with just a specific set of criteria, you know, starting the artistic, the creative challenge of thinking, well, how can I make work in this context? But with this is my starting point. You know, this is now my starting point. These are now the criteria that I need to make work within, um, you know, which was a big change in thinking uh, for him. And again, that's quite exciting, isn't it? How can we continue to work internationally? But thinking about it completely differently uh, and making it work. But yeah, we can do it. Mm. It will work. Thanks for that note of positivity, Danielle, that's great. <laughs> um, and that is probably a good place to end because I'm conscious of the time and we've come to the end of our scheduled time for this session and all of our speakers who are very, very busy. Um, thank you so much for your time. Um, I'm going to be sharing with everybody the presentations from today. There is an invitation to connect with our speakers um, and I'm sure they're all happy for us to share their contact details as well. Um, and yeah, the invitation is open there to um, keep having those discussions. Um, so yeah, lovely to see you all. Thank you so much for joining us.